If you have an insatiable appetite for self-directed learning, you want to grow your mind, you want to be a better reader, a better researcher, a better thinker, then this video is for you. See, the meta of learning is just as important as the subjects themselves. If you don't know how to learn well, if you don't know how to read and judge books and pass the information well, you don't know how to reflect on things, you don't know how to doggedly develop skills and meditate on what you're learning, then you will be relegated to a life of pure information acquisition. Now, there's someone called Isaac Watts who knows a thing or two about this. As a prolific theologian, logician, and songwriter, he wrote over 750 hymns as well as various guidebooks on topics like geometry and logic and philosophy. His book on logic was used at Oxford University at one point, and his more accessible book, The Improvement of the Mind, which was written as a supplement to that logic book, is a treasure trove of insight on how to learn better, how to think better, and ultimately how to improve your mind. In this video, we're going to dive in to the key principles, concepts, and strategies that Watts recommends for those wanting to learn better and to improve their mind. Now, our core focus is going to be on what Watts calls the five methods or five modes of improvement. These are five methods of learning, observation, reading, conversation, lecture, so live instruction, and then study and meditation. But before we get to these, let's look at three foundational principles for self-directed learning. Those are intellectual humility, avoidance of dogmatism, and the necessity of diligence. So to be an effective self-learner, you must adopt a posture of intellectual humility. You must purposely remind yourself of how little you know. Your poverty of understanding is what's caused it. And doing this will ignite your ambition. It will ignite your hunger and appetite for learning. Quote from the book. You should therefore contrive and practice some proper methods to acquaint yourself with your own ignorance and to impress your mind with a deep and painful sense of the low and imperfect degrees of your present knowledge that you may be incited with labor and activity to pursue after greater measures. The egotistical, conceited person lacks this intellectual humility and they suffer because of it. They lack drive, they lack hunger, and they are lazy as a result. In Watts words, remember this, that if upon some few superficial acquirements you value, exalt, and swell yourself as though you were a man of learning already, you are thereby building a most unpalatable barrier against all improvement. You will lie down and indulge idleness and rest yourself content in the midst of deep and shameful ignorance. Now, ego is not the only barrier to learning. You must also avoid dogmatism. What says in the book, and I'm paraphrasing here, that you shouldn't fix yourself to a position before you've really studied it, before you've looked at the subject, you've looked at the counter arguments, you've looked at the landscape, and you can see things from all sides. What a lot of people do and what you and I have a tendency to do as well, because we're humans, is we learn about something, we believe it's all correct, and then we just become dogmatic about it. We think that we're right and we can't be wrong, and this affects our ability to learn, because we get stuck or concreted in a position, and we basically shut down our learning and observation faculties. The dedicated self-learner is not satisfied with easily or quickly attained knowledge because they know that nuance exists, right? Topics and fields must be studied, not just glanced at. The dogmatist lets ideas take dominion over himself. And finally, the committed self-learner is someone who is diligent, someone who labors but does so in delight. Quote from the book, be not so weak as to imagine that a life of learning is a life of laziness and ease. Dare not Give up yourself to any of the learned professions unless you are resolved to labor hard at study and can make it your delight and the joy of your life. A life of learning should be laborious but delightful. If it's not at least somewhat difficult, if it's not at least somewhat laborious, then you're probably not learning much. But if it's not at all delightful, then you're probably learning the wrong things. You're not following your curiosity and your interest. Now, with the foundation of humility, the avoidance of dogmatism and diligence, let us look at Isaac Watts' five methods 
of improvement. There are five eminent means or methods whereby the mind is improved by the knowledge of things. These are observation, reading, instruction by lectures, conversation, and meditation. Let's start with improvement by observation. What says that observation is the notice that we take of all occurrences in human life, whether they are sensible or intellectual, whether relating to persons or things, to ourselves or others. He places observation as the first mode of improvement because it's the most direct. It's what we do all the time. We are always observing the world around us, people, places, animals, objects, and we're always observing ourselves and our own inner workings, our thoughts, right? The effective self-learner is the one who reflects on these things. Most people don't. Most people don't engage in any such reflection or introspection, and they don't profit from their observations, even if those observations are fleeting. And so one way we can improve our mind is simply to observe it, to observe our own inner thoughts, as Watt says. Let the enlargement of your knowledge be one constant view and design in life. Since there is no place, no transactions, occurrences or engagements in life which exclude us from this method of improving the mind. When we are alone, even in darkness and silence, we may converse with our own hearts, observe the working of our own spirits and reflect upon the inwards motions of our own passions in some of the latest occurrences in life. We may acquaint ourselves with the powers and properties, the tendencies and inclinations, both of body and spirit, and gain a more intimate knowledge of ourselves. And of course, we can observe human nature as well. When we are in company, we may discover something more of human nature, of human passions and follies, and of human affairs, vices and virtues, by conversing with mankind and observing their conduct. Every moment is a moment that you can use to improve your own mind. Seek lessons in all that you observe. And as Watts recommends, write them down and take review occasionally. The second mode of improvement is reading. I have made a video on reading advice that I wish someone had told me earlier. So if you want to go deeper on this specific mode of improvement, then check that out. But there are some interesting tips and principles that Watts talks about in this book when it comes to reading. In fact, his chapter on reading or section on reading is actually quite large. There's a lot in it. And there's too much to go through in this video. So I encourage you to read the book if you want to learn more about that. One of the first things he points out is that books are a very useful form of improvement and learning because they are highly refined in a way that conversations with people, lectures, observation is not. He points out, in more words than I'm about to say, is that books that have stood the test of time are usually written by wise people. Not only that, they are the matured, and refined thoughts of such wise people. Books take a lot of effort to write. They are a slow medium. They are edited, right, in a way where me talking to you or us having a conversation is not. It's not as high signal as a book is. And so you should read books. He does say, however, that you should be judicious about the books that you read. There are too many books out there. Many of them aren't that good and others are irrelevant to you and not useful given your goals. So he's basically saying, don't just read everything. Don't just read anything. Exercise judgment. Be smart about it. One of the key strategies he recommends is to engage in inspectional reading. If you've read How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler, you'll know what this is. And essentially, inspectional reading is to figure out if something is worth reading in the first place. You don't need to do this with every book, but if you're not sure whether it's going to be good, then it's worth doing. Essentially, you open a book, you look at the table of contents, perhaps, you kind of get, a, get an idea of like what it's about, whether it's relevant to you. You might flip through to a few pages, try and gauge the quality of the book, and then decide if you want to commit to it. I actually did exactly that with this book, by the way. Uh, the other day, I was standing up, looking at my bookshelf. This title stuck out to me, and I was like, all right, let's, uh, haven't read this yet, look at the table of contents. It was exactly what I wanted to read and wanted to learn about. And so I just started diving in. It was really good. Also on that note, if the book clearly is not good or useful to you and you don't enjoy it, then stop reading. As Watt says, life is too short and time is too precious to read every new book quite over in order to find that it is not worth the reading. One thing he recommends is to read books with other people, with friends. Conversation, he points out, will unlock aspects of the book that wouldn't be unlocked otherwise. 
And one interesting idea he puts forth is that you should read distinct books on the same subject and then cross-reference with each other. So perhaps you and two other people want to learn about psychology or mathematics or some specific subject. Mathematics isn't very specific, neither psychology. You get the idea. You want to learn about a subject, maybe you find a book each on that subject and you go away and read them and then come to discuss it. And you'll each have slight differences or maybe significant differences in what you've learned. Another thing that Watts recommends with reading is to not get caught up in the exciting and novel. You know when you're reading something new or you're learning about a new subject, especially if it's a subject that's not like hard science, you can become convinced by things just because they're new to you, even if they're not well argued, right? And so again, it goes back to that avoidance of dogmatism. When you're reading something new for the first time, you're learning about a new subject, you should be approaching it, not necessarily from a position of skepticism, but just be being wary of that tendency that you have to get caught up in it all and to take it at face value instead of thinking critically about what you're reading. He stresses the importance of marking your books, so correcting them, conversing with them. If you come across text that you like, then mark, then highlight it. Mention something in the sidebar, like I love the sentence, it's written really well. If you come across something you dislike or you think could be written better, then point that out to yourself. Argue with your books, converse with them, Doing this properly takes a lot of time, the way Watts is talking about it, but it's worth it. Quote, remember that one book read over in this manner with all this laborious meditation will tend more to enrich your understanding than the skimming over the surface of 20 authors. This is advice I shared in my other video on reading, which is that you get more by going through books again and again and again and understanding them deeply than spreading yourself across a number of books and only just touching the surface of them. One of the common themes which relates to all this is the importance of reflection, particularly with reading, right? As he says, as a man may be eating all day and for want of digestion is never nourished, so these endless readers may cram themselves in vain with intellectual food and without real improvement of their minds for want of digesting it by proper reflections. Now, the third mode of improvement is living instructors, tutors, you know, lectures. We're not going to spend too much time on this, uh, and neither does Watts, actually, in the book. He spends more time on what you should be doing as a lecturer or as a teacher near the end of the book, but that's beyond the scope of this video. One of the things he points out about this mode of improvement is that lecture is lively. It's animated in a way that a book isn't. And because of this, it can not only be more engaging, but it can help you untangle difficult aspects of a subject. That's why a lot of people find it easier to learn something like maths or science from videos on Khan Academy than they do textbooks. Because having someone explain the intricacies of it in a way that the textbook might not or might not do as effectively is very helpful. And there do seem to be subjects that almost require a interaction with someone else, a tutor, as what says. There is scarce any science so safely and so speedily learned, even by the most noblest genius in the best books, without a tutor. Books are a sort of dumb teacher. They point out the way to learning, but if we labor under any doubt or mistake, they cannot answer sudden questions or explain present doubts and difficulties. This is probably the work of a living instructor. Essentially what he's saying is that you can spend, you can waste a lot of time going in the wrong direction if you have no one to challenge your thinking and look at what you're learning. The fourth mode of improvement is conversation. And to introduce this mode of improvement, he kind of talks about the contemptible scholar, this idea of the contemptible scholar. He says that the person who just reads books and just observes things you know, there's sort of this like hermit and the hermit rusts and develops an awkwardness, right? Engaging in conversation, living in the real world helps you avoid this. It helps prevent it. And hopefully you're not this person, but you will know one or you will know of one. The person who does spend all their time at home, just reads books, you know, never goes out and they do develop the sense of awkwardness. You don't want to be that person. And one way to avoid being that person is to engage in conversation. Not only is it useful to avoid being awkward, it's useful for improving your mind. And there's a few key points here, which I want to point out. The first point is that you can learn something from everyone. What says, if you happen to be in company with a merchant or sailor, a farmer or a mechanic, a milkmaid or a spinster, 
lead them into a discourse of the matters of their own profession. For everyone knows or should know his own business best. In this sense, a common mechanic is wiser than a philosopher. By this means, you may gain some improvement in knowledge from everyone you meet. There's a skill to this. There's a skill to conversing with people and asking the right questions to get deep into what they know. You have to go beyond the small talk and follow up and find those paths. The second point he makes is to avoid echo chambers. Confine yourself not always to one sort of company or to persons of the same party or opinion, either in matters of learning, religion, or the civil life. Lest if you should happen to be nursed up or educated an early mistake, you should be confirmed and established in the same mistake by conversing only with persons of the same sentiments. Now, people don't do this because they don't like hearing opinions that are contrary to their own. And here's what Watts has to say about that. Be not frightened nor provoked at opinions different from your own. Some persons are so confident they are in the right that they will not come within the hearing of any notions but their own. They canton out to themselves a little province in the intellectual world where they fancy the light shines and all the rest is darkness. One of his recommendations to improve at conversation is to actually build your own mastermind, build your own group of people who are also self-learners, who are also autodidacts, who want to get better, want to improve their mind. He says, it is of considerable advantage when we are pursuing any difficult point of knowledge to have a society of ingenious correspondence at hand. For every man has something of a different genius and a various turn of mind, whereby the subject proposed will be shown in all its lights, it will be represented in all its forms, and every side of it be turned to view that a just judgment may be framed. Iron sharpens iron. When you're around other people who are also learning similar things to you or not, you get this feedback that you don't get when you're by yourself. This is also what Benjamin Franklin did. He set up a group of started with 12 people and it was a society or community essentially of mutual improvement as he called it they debated questions of morals politics philosophy business you name it so if you don't have something like this consider whether you can set one up it doesn't have to be in person it can be online it can be on zoom but it's something that's worth doing now the final method of improvement which he spends a lot of time on and we're going to spend some time on is that of study and meditation. He uses these terms interchangeably. When he talks about meditation, he really means study. And study, as Watts defines it, is the bringing together of it all, the reflection, the understanding, the thinking, right? Another way to put it would be the synthesis. It's very important. It is the heart of learning. And that is because consuming information alone is not enough. Memory is not enough. What says, as you are not to fancy yourself a learned man because you are dressed with a ready wit, so neither must you imagine that large and laborious reading and a strong memory can denominate you truly wise. You can't become wise by just reading alone, is what he's saying. Why? Because it is meditation and studious thought it is the exercise of your own reason and judgment upon all you read that gives good sense even to the best genius and affords your understanding the truest improvement. He goes on. Mere lectures, reading and conversation without thinking are not sufficient to make a man of knowledge and wisdom. It is our own thought and reflection, study and meditation must attend all the other methods of improvement and perfect them. You must think, you must reflect. This is how we make ideas our own, by the way. When you read an idea in a book, like I've been doing with this video, I'm just transferring it to you, right? But when you think through things and when you study and you meditate, you can form your own opinions, you can form your own synthesis and come up with what seem like original, unique ideas, even though they are built upon a foundation of other ideas. One thing he says is to not spend time on the complicated in particular before you've built the foundation. Essentially that you shouldn't try and learn something that you don't know about or you don't have the necessary prerequisites for, which sounds obvious, but like a lot of people do it, including myself. I get attracted to the complicated, like complex things and I'm like, oh, I can learn this. And it's like, bro, you haven't like, you don't even know how to do algebra at this level and this is like five levels beyond that so you need to learn this first if you want to do that you can't just like jump 
all the way to there. It's not how it works. He says, let not young students apply themselves to search out deep, dark, and abstruse matters far above their reach or spend their labor in any peculiar subjects for which they have not the advantages of necessary antecedent learning or books or observations. Four, this will confound rather than enlighten the understanding and create an aversion to future diligence and perhaps by despair may forbid the pursuit of that subject forever afterwards. If you go into the complicated subject too early without the foundation, you probably won't like it, you'll feel stupid and you may not revisit it in the future. Now, at the same time, you shouldn't trick yourself into thinking that just because something is difficult to learn, just because a subject seems tricky, that it's insurmountable. This is the other end of the spectrum, right? He says, nor let any student, on the other hand, fright himself at every turn with insurmountable difficulties, nor imagine that the truth is wrapped up in impenetrable darkness. These are formidable spectres which the understanding raises sometimes to flatter its own laziness. We rationalize our way out of learning subjects because we just want that homeostasis. We want to be lazy. We don't want to put in the effort. And so we say to ourselves, it's too hard. It's impossible for me to learn. How do you learn these things, these complex subjects? Here's what Watt says. Those things which in a remote and confused view seem very obscure and perplexed may be approached by gentle and regular steps and may then unfold and explain themselves at large to the eye. The hardest problems in geometry and the most intricate schemes or diagrams may be explicated and understood step by step. Every great mathematician bears a constant witness to this observation. The next two tips or principles are very useful. Uh, the first is that you should not study too many things at once. I've talked about this a bunch on the channel. Don't need to go into it too much. But obviously, if you have too many subjects on the go, then you know, you're not going to be able to focus very well. You're not going to be able to dedicate the time necessary to really make progress. However, Isaac Watts doesn't recommend that you only spend time on one subject. He actually says that having more than one subject on the go is useful for productivity, useful for study. He says, where two or three sciences are pursued at the same time, if one of them be dry, abstracted and unpleasant, say logic, metaphysics, law, languages, let another be more entertaining and agreeable to secure the mind from weariness and aversion to study. What he's basically saying is that if you just have one subject, like let's say you're learning logic, right? And you can do maybe two hours of that in a day. And by those two hours, you're, you're just like, I'm done with this. I'm, it's so boring. It's so dry. I know it's important for me to learn. It's somewhat interesting, but I can't do it for more than two hours a day. Well, if, if that's all you're learning, then that's all you're going to be able to do in a day. But if you have another subject on the go, something that's more interesting to you, maybe you're learning to make music or maybe you're you know learning to write poetry or something then you can switch to that when you fatigue of the harder subject or the more boring subject this is the power of deviation or productive procrastination something Noah Ryan and I talked about in our recent interview that you have a thing or a project on the go that you want to procrastinate on and you let yourself procrastinate on it so you can do other productive things over here to move yourself forward. Another thing he points out is what's commonly known as the man with a hammer fallacy, or at least a variation of it, which is to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. What he says is that you shouldn't let a single subject or topical area prevail over your mind, quote, as to give a sovereign tincture to all your other studies and discolor all your ideas. Like a person in jaundice who spreads a yellow scene with his eyes over all the objects which he meets. And he uses the example of a man, he says, who had particular skill in music and much devoted to that subject, who found a great resemblance of the Athanasian doctrine of the Trinity in every single note. And so he's he's applying this like thing he learns in music to this subject of theology. And it doesn't necessarily connect, but because he views everything through the lens of music, that's how he, he sees things. And he's like, you shouldn't do that because each subject like sits on its own. There are references and they cross over and there's interactions between them, of course. But if you're the person who just lets the one subject take sovereignty over your mind, then it's going to make you stupid. 
This is the man with the hammer fallacy. The final piece of advice that I want to share is to not seek certainty in everything, but be content with probability. Do not expect to arrive at certainty in every subject which you pursue. There are a hundred things wherein we mortals in this dark and imperfect state must be content with probability, where our best light and reasonings will reach no further. Other than a few subjects, there's no way you can reach certainty in most things you learn. If you're studying psychology, good luck because there's just so much nonsense and noise and like uncertainty in that field. Same with history, same with philosophy. And so you need to be content with probability. You need to get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm pretty sure this is what it means, but I'm never going to be one plus one equals two certain about it. And for me to try is probably not a useful thing to do. All right, so to wrap this up, I want to share one final principle, which really brings it all together. And that is that you should not just focus on one method of improvement. You should bring them all together for your benefit. If you only read and listen, then you will have, as Watt says, a mere historical knowledge of learning and only be able to tell what others have known or said on the subject. If you only converse, but you don't read or observe or study, you will gain a slight and superficial knowledge which will be in danger of vanishing with the voice of the speaker. And if you confine yourself to yourself and you only observe and don't do anything else, then you will be, as Isaac Watt says, in danger of a narrow spirit a vain conceit of yourself and an unreasonable contempt of others. And you will have a very limited and imperfect view of the knowledge of things and you will seldom learn how to make that knowledge useful. These five methods of improvement we've looked at should be pursued jointly. However, what does say that you should spend more time in reading and study meditation than the others. So he does place a little bit more importance on those two methods of improvement. So that is it for this video. I hope you found it useful. Uh, if you want to learn more about how to read effectively, you want to learn the advice that I wish someone had told me earlier about reading and self-learning, then check out this video here. I talk about 14 or 15 tips that I don't think are very common. They're not like basic tips, uh, but they've helped me a lot with developing my reading plan and system. Thanks for watching. See you next time.